Gracious Father, we're so thankful for your goodness to us. We ask that your spirit might guide and direct us as we think together, as we study together. May Christ be glorified. In his name, amen. All right, our title is um, 1888, Socialism and End Times. And um, before we get into the main part of this, we need some hope. <laughs> we need to remember that Christ's outstretched arm and hand from the cross will never, ever let us go. And uh, I've <clears throat> got a couple of pictures here. This is his hand, the nail-pierced hand that will hold on. He's never lost a case yet. doesn't matter the color of your skin, whether it be black, white, pink, or blue, whatever. Uh, he will hold on to us. He will not let go. In fact, in uh, uh, John 10, but also John 6, 37, he said, if anyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. There's a double negative in the original language. And usually in, in English, a double negative will cancel out each other. This is not the case. There are two different negatives. And it says, no, you will never, I will never, ever. It's impossible for me to let you go. It's possible. We... Uh, and I, what we're seeing today in the world, we need to realize that he is in control. Not we ourselves, not communism, not socialism, whatever. Christ is in control. We're going to look at some things of uh, socialism and that sort of thing that may be a bit startling. But uh, we're going to get into that in a little bit. Another one is in Ephesians chapter 4 that I want to read. And uh, <clears throat> this is beginning... Uh, about 17. Actually, I think I want to go up even a little further from that. Um, yeah, 14. We should no longer be tossed like children to and fro by every word of doctrine and by the trickery of man. It's because Christ is in charge. He will hold us. He will not let us go. And then I want to drop down to verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk in the rest, as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their minds. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their hearts. And I want to continue. Who being past feeling, have given themselves over to licentiousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But to you, you have not been so, you have not learned such, you have not learned of Christ this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be removed in the spirit of your mind. <clears throat> There's a battle going on for the mind of mankind today and for the body and for the life. And that's why we need to know Christ. There's one thing we need to know and that is Jesus Christ. We need, be, we need to be aware of current, current events but we must not be concentrated on them to the neglect of knowing Jesus Christ. Because he's the one that saves. And <clears throat> as we get into this, we're facing a similar thing that happened in the days of Paul. The leading educational centers of Paul's day were located in Ephesus, Corinth, and Athens. And you know what Paul called them? He labeled the Greek, uh, Greek educational system of wisdom as ignorance and foolishness. We're facing that today. Things that are happening today in the world come through public educational systems. It's amazing to see these things as they're, as they're unfolding. And um, in Acts 20, 29, Paul uh, warned the church in Ephesus. He says, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And I thought I'd like this picture. <clears throat> we have the wolf in sheep, sheep's clothing. A couple of them there. Luther 
had this to say. He said, I much fear the universities will become wide gates to hell if due care is not taken to explain the Holy Scriptures and engrave it on the hearts of the students. My advice to every person is not to place his child where the Scripture does not reign paramount. Every institution in which the studies carried on lead to a relaxed consideration of the Word of God, and it will prove corrupting. And uh, one time I was in Germany, and I did a series of studies on the principles of education. And the worldly one, based on Greek philosophical methods, is to begin with doubt. If you learn to doubt, then you re remove the doubt, and then you can learn something. But I would say this, so long as we learn doubt, we can never know truth. It's an impossibility. The key to understanding is faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians, not Ephesians, but Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, it says it's through faith we understand. I was talking about the creation of the worlds, but it's through faith in Christ that we understand. And I remember <coughs> giving, uh, well, I, there were two French people that were with me. They were kind of guiding two, two Americans. And we're going to deal with educational principles in Germany. And so we, there was a huge room. People were sit, sitting on, around tables. And uh, I mentioned that the way to understanding is through faith. And I asked the question. And the, the, uh, one of the pastors was uh, translating and he was putting on a chalkboard. And I said this, how, how did you learn your alphabet? How did you know that A is A and B is B and C is C? What would you say to that? What, okay, yes, it's something that is not something that you can discover. We have to be taught that. We need to accept what the teacher said, our parents say, then we can know what's going on. And uh, I, I, there was an uproar. There were two businessmen on the other side. <laughs> they were f just fighting mad. And they were trying to split the two of us, and uh, Americans, and uh, we wouldn't allow it. And after, the, after it was over, well, there was another girl. She was down on the, on the left of us, and she was fit to be tied. And uh, I thought, man, I didn't realize I was going to stir up so much here. <laughs> but afterward, we had lunch together. And the girl had calmed down, and she came, she came to me, and she said, you know, you really made me mad. And I said, well, I knew something had happened. I said, what did I do? <laughs> and she said, you completely undermined our educational system here in Germany. She was a teacher. And she said, we were told that Luther said the best way to uh, doubt, or the best way to learn is through doubt. He, he doubted the, the, edu the educational system and the spiritual system. And I said, no, he presented truth. He believed. And that's, in fact, he started parochial schools. He was the first one that did among Protestants. And uh, so she, she said that they were, told, they were taught that, that uh, Socrates and Aristotle were their models for study. And the two gentlemen across from us, they calmed down. And they, they didn't apologize to me, but they apologized to the friend that was, <laughs> that was with me. <laughs> but, uh, but the educational system in Paul's day, in the educational system in Luther's day, and the educational system in our day is identical in destroying the Word of God, denying God, and is bringing in socialism. This is where it's coming from. And uh, we'll, we'll get into this as we see. 1888 was the tur turning point for Seventh-day Adventists. And there were two young men that God raised up to give a message of salvation in Christ alone. And uh, I'm going to list some books that if you want, want some information to study, maybe you've already have them. But these are four books on uh, 1888, the information that we have historically, experientially. And uh, there are uh, over 1,800 pages in the four of them, but it's well worth your read. Um, number one, the first volume, chapter one, there's a caution about making doctrinal differences prominent. And it was a letter written to Jones and Wagoner. They were editors of the, Review of the Signs of the Times. Uriah Smith was editor of the Review and Herald, and um, Elder Butler was the General Conference president. And so they were firing back. Jo Jones and Wagner were writing things that stirred up the brethren. 
And they would write back and stir up Jones and Wagner. Ellen White wrote to Jones and Wagner. She said, you must not be doing this. We not, must not make doctrinal differences in the public. Now, it was her habit to send this kind of material to Butler and to Smith. And when they read that, they said, aha, she's on our side. <laughs> and she fired a letter to them and said, no, that is not what I meant. Um, she says, now because of uh, what you're doing, she says, now Brother Wagner needs to have an opportunity to share his position. And uh, that was leading up to the 1888 conference. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. There's something else happened in 1888. The Communist Manifesto was republished in this year and by Frederick Engels. He was a sidekick of Karl Marx. They had, they had co-authored this in 1848, and uh, Marx had died in 1883. So Engels, and it was a, he was a complete failure, complete failure as a political entity, as an economics uh, major from college, um, as a family man, everything that he did was a complete failure. And uh, I've got some statements in here. He was manipulated by the devil. There is no doubt. And we have some statements. He was a poet as well as a writer against uh, capitalism and against uh, democracy and industry. Um, but anyhow, he had died, and so Engels took this up, and uh, by this time, it was pretty well dead. But from this, by the turn of the century, 1900, the Russian group, Bolsheviks, under Lenin, took up the torch and carried it forward. But I will say this, Lenin, Lenin was a complete failure. Communism in Russia was a complete failure. It only lasted 74 years, and it went through about three or four men. The next one was Stalin. He was a complete failure. Then Khrushchev, who hated Stalin, and was very close to him, and he didn't dare let Stalin know that he didn't like him because he would have been executed. <laughs> and so he was very careful. But when he, when he got in to become the leader of the Communist Party there, he made some changes, and then finally uh, uh, the thing fell apart. Total failure. This has been tried in Cambodia, total failure. It's happened in Cuba, a total failure. It's happened in Venezuela right now, a complete failure. Nothing about it has, has worked. China is a complete failure. Now there's some say, oh, look at all the money they're making. Why? Because they've turned to capitalism, <laughs> the very thing they hate. Capitalism came out of the Protestant Reformation came out of the message of justification by faith. We're going to see that a little bit later. But that's where it's from. So uh, what we're seeing in the United States today is a shift from Protestantism. We are no longer a Protestant nation. We have shifted from Protestantism and we're ship shifting into socialism. And it will end up in communism. And that will be the end of the United States as we know it. Now whether this will bring in the end time <coughs> uh, scenarios, we don't know yet. But uh, the United States can still be brought to its knees. It will rise again, and it will come back with a re religious fervor that will enact laws that will destroy our Constitution and will be against any Christian who wants to serve God and serve, uh, serve him through the Bible. But 1888 was, a, was one of those major um, changes, both in communism and in Adventism. The two didn't lock horns yet at that time, but it will before this thing is over. The message that God has given to us is the only thing that can defeat these things. The only thing. Christ and his righteousness. Now, the system to which we and the United States are heading is similar to that of the Dark Ages. And here's illustrated in a, in a um, triangle, but on the bottom of this you have Peasants and serfs, they were the work people. Say in agriculture, they grew the crops, they harvested them, they could take a little bit, not very much, they could not take much of what they had. They didn't own it. So it went up the next step to knights or lords, whoever was over them, whoever owned the property or had deeds to the property. 
And then from there it went to nobles and bishops, and or both. And then from there it went to kings and queens. And from that you have the papacy. The popes were on top of the heap. This is where we're headed uh, today. Here's, uh, this is what's going on today. We have socialism and communism. That's at the hop, top of the heat. There are politicians who are talking about this very thing. Now, on the, on the base of this are the controlled working class and the poor. They're using the poor and the working class as Marx did to destroy capitalism and the things that were going on in, in Europe and in the United States. He hated America also, as well as the, the people in, uh, in Europe. But so you have, uh, under the communism, socialism, you have government and you have privileged social elites. These are the moneyed people. I'm not talking about uh, middle class. Well, let me go to the next one. Well, here is, there's no middle class in this system. Uh, the privileged society are the ultra-rich. I'm talking about big, big, big business. They are behind the destruction of the small businessman in the streets of Chicago, Minnesota, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, Portland, and Seattle. New York is another one. They're trying to eliminate the, the middle class, and it's the people that have small businesses. It's small businesses are what keeps the United States running and perking. Once they're out of the way, then big business has control. They don't want competition from them. They're, they have enough competition for one or the other, and so they want to eliminate those whom they can. And uh, that's what's happening today. It's slipping away uh, from, from our standpoint. Um, so this is not unlike the feudal system of the Dark Ages. And um, the question is, who is pushing this agenda? And I've got a list of things here. Academia, number one. Second, politicians. Number three, scientists. Four, religious leaders. Five, environmentalists. Six, big, big business. I'm talking about multi-millionaires or businesses, billionaires and trillionaires. They're the pushing. This. You know, uh, Ford Motor Company, just an example of this. There's others, high tech, they did the same thing. They poured all kinds of money into these rioters and anarchists that were tearing down the cities. Uh, Ford put in, I think it was $90 million last year into uh, one of them. And, uh, but, so this is, this is what's happening now. And then Jesuit re uh, theology, I'm not going to get into that, but that's one of them. They hate capitalism, always have and always will. Uh, if you remember, some of you, well, some of you were not alive perhaps in the 80s. <laughs> But uh, during that time, well, the 70s and 80s, there was all kinds of uh, uh, revolutions going on in South America. A lot of this was gendered by what they called liberation theology, and this was um, piloted by, uh, by Jesuits. And there was a very strong battle going on within uh, the Church of Rome over this very thing. Many of the popes go, and I remember reading one, uh, one of the in fact, this pope went and shook his finger at a bishop down there who was, who was uh, into, into communist uh, activities and, uh, and the um, liberation theology. There were, during that time, there were several n nuns that were killed and also some priests. They were all a part the, of the revolution army. Now, they became martyrs to the Catholic Church, but they were actually involved in overthrowing nations in... in uh, South America. And some of them would like to see that done here in America, but I'm not going to go into that. That's just a teaser on that. Um, when, I, when I started uh, doing research on this a few months ago, um, I decided to, I, I knew that Marx was the principal contributor to all of this. And so I went on the internet to see what I could find. Uh, actually, I was looking for some negatives. When I first started, I did not find a single negative. From academia to students, politicians, none of them spoke out against um, Marxism. But as I dug into this, I saw some of the things that are going on today that 
it can be frightening. But, uh, but again, coming back to the topic, and we're going to move away from it, come back again. <clears throat> but 1888, socialism and end times. But first, I want to share this with you. God sent us truth that we should not have had unless, and here's the full quote, God has sent men, and this is speaking of Jones and Wagner, to bring us the truth that we should not have had unless God had sent somebody to bring it to us. That's the kind of message God sent to us. Now, here these men are. A. T. Jones was a military man in Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, he was a historian. He, he devoured history. I, I read one time, shortly after I became an Adventist, I, I, got in, I had the fortunate uh, happening that I was able to study them even before I went to college. These four books that I've got here, uh, some of uh, eight, nine, nine hundred pages, I read all of these. <laughs> and it, it's not the easiest read because he, he repeats a lot and the different uh, idioms and things of that nature uh, are, you know, somewhat different. But there's richness there. And, uh, and I, I learned to understand principle in history and prophecy and things like this. But the two republics, 1891, 895 pages. Um, this is dealing with Republic of Rome and the Republic of the United States. We're following in the same path as pagan Rome. Empires of the Bible uh, start with Genesis 10 with the uh, old Babylon and then it traces all the way down to the Babylon of which the Jews are taken captive. And then the great empires of the Bible start from there with Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and Rome in the book of Daniel, chapter 2 and chapter 7 and chapter 11. And then ecclesiastical empire is dealing with the papacy. And I tell you, this is a rich book. It is, he deals with principles that we, we can understand what's, some what's going on. There's some things that are covered up you can't see right now. But he did a fantastic job on that. So I was just mentioning that um, uh, these are, bo if you can get them, buy them and <laughs> read them. Take time, take a year, two, whatever it takes. But <laughs> you, you'll understand some things that, that uh, will be a blessing to you. Uh, in fact, I was so much moved by these things. I went, well, after I went to college, in fact, you might remember the teacher. He was an Australian, tremendous teacher. And uh, I was sure he would, uh, <laughs> he would accept this material. And so I went to him and I, I said, shared with him, and I said, you know, is there a possibility that you could put these on the list so that, and, and assign students uh, to these for classwork? I said, this is a fan fantastic series. No, he said, that's old stuff. We've got modern things. <laughs> and I said, that's true. And I said, there's some things would have to change. You know, that we've got more information now than 100 years ago. But I said, the principles that he deals with, they're, they're untouchable. But he decided not to go that route. So, <laughs> so I got to enjoy them myself. Um, then Jones had uh, camp meetings in 1899. And he, presentations were the precious subject of Christ and his righteousness, faith in Christ. And it was a flood of light, we're told. And then <clears throat> he, uh, he was a principal speaker in the 1883 and 1895 General Conference bulletins. And his most significant contributions were sermons that he did on the three angels' messages, and it was a message of Christ and his righteousness. And he started out, it's interesting, he started out with current events and then went into um, the message of salvation in Christ alone. And so I've tried to model after that in this one. <laughs> I don't usually speak on current events. But this one has got me going. Uh, <laughs> and I may, may spend too much time on the current events, but I think we need to understand some of the things that are going on. Um, he's also known for his work in preserving liberty of conscience as guaranteed by God and as under the First Amendment of the Constitution. He was very strong on this. Uh, in fact, shortly after 1888, he was sent to Washington, D.C. by the General Conference to deal with a Blair Sunday Bill. You're familiar with that. Uh, and then uh, two or three years later, another bill that had come up, and God used him to stop the uh, uh, stop these things. Now they still continued to try to enact them up until about 1910, but it finally fizzled out, and uh, we've been uh, in that condition ever since. 
Uh, oh, I, I need to share that. I had a fr- uh, Presbyterian pastor. We were tremendous friends. And at that time, uh, homosexuality was coming into the ministry in his, the Northern Presbyterians. And he and I would get together. And one time he was going to a meeting where they're going to discuss this. He said, Jerry, I wish you could come with me. <laughs> it looked like he was standing all alone. And, uh, but we talked about this, and I couldn't, couldn't go to pray, pray with him. But um, we talked about the Sabbath and Sunday. And um, I kept telling him, I said, the Sabbath is a sign of righteousness by faith. And I didn't carry it out, the other, the other leg of this. But he kept inviting me and Shirley to come worship with him on a Sunday. And I didn't want to I put it off, you know. One Sunday morning, early, God awakened me, and I was impressed to go to the Presbyterian Church to worship. <laughs> and so Shirley and I went. We were just a little bit late. I don't like to be late, but we were late that day. And the deacon marches all the way down to the front row right there. And this guy, yeah, at about where you're at, maybe a little more. And this guy, he was a big, tall guy, big, bushy mustache, always smiling. He was coming out of his office, and those long legs were pumping like this. He was smiling, and he looked over the audience, just a big grin, and he said, oh, no. <laughs> he says, of all times for the seven-day Adventist pastor to be here is today. And I just smiled. And he said, we've been going through the Ten Commandments. Which one do you think they were on? <laughs> they were on the fourth one. And then I just smiled back at him. And uh, then he got really serious talking to his congregation. He said, you know, we lost the Sunday blue law. Now, I was on opposite ends with him. They were trying to bring in the Sunday blue law into that state. Again, trying to reenact it. And they lost at the state level. And I didn't know that until that Sunday morning. And that's when he said, we lost the battle of the Sunday blue law. And he says, I guess we're going to have to keep Sunday by faith alone, just as the Seventh-day Adventists keep the Sabbath by faith alone. <laughs> now, I didn't carry that out either. <laughs> he had enough on his plate. But I believe he's an honest man. And he actually, he actually left that Northern Presbyterian Church because of what was going on and then joined the Southern Presbyterian. So they had not, not gone as far as uh, the others had done. But, but uh, now, I wasn't intending to share that with you, but I think I thought it fit in here <laughs> as an illustration. Now, here are uh, some of Wagner's better-known uh, writings. The Gospel in Galatians is a review. This is a review that came out of 1888. It was actually uh, the, a copy of this was given, 100, 100 copies, I believe, was given to the delegates at that time. This was the response of uh, Wagner to Elder Butler. Butler had written a book called uh, the, the law in Galatians, and he said it was only ceremonial. And uh, Jones and Wagner believed it was, there were ceremonial aspects of it, but the main one was the moral law. And so they, they clashed on this, and I, uh, Wagner really uh, took him apart in a kind way. But, uh, and then that, this material was then uh, presented at the General Conference in 1888. And it's a good, that's a good read, too. And then he wrote Fathers of the Catholic Church. Yeah, there are many more than I've got here, but I just, these are some of the main ones that I read, I read parts of it at least. Uh, Prophetic Lights is a study in the book of Daniel, the prophecies, really good. Uh, Christ and His Righteousness in 1890. This came out of the 1888 conference. Uh, his wife, we're told, uh, wrote down in shorthand all the talks that he gave. And then some of these were put into the Sign of the Times Within a year, no, yeah, in fact, it was from November to January, they started coming out in the Signs of the Times. And then finally were uh, published in uh, the book Christ and His Righteousness. And then sermons on Romans, these were articles that he gave, actually not articles, they were sermons at the General Conference uh, at that time. And then the Gospel and Creation is another one. Wagner on Romans, these were articles from the Signs of the Times in 1895 and 1896. And I had uh, my secretary, or actually it was a girl, a, a student, I asked her if she would type all of these into my computer, which she did. And they sat in my computer for years. And in the 18, uh, whoop, not, can't be not 18, <laughs> I'm not that old yet. Ni- in the 1980s, we were having a meeting, uh, our committee was meeting, and that they were coming up, the general conference was coming up with, uh, uh, or the Sabbath school department, was coming up with a study on Romans in that year. 
And so we discussed about writing a book. And I said, well, you know, I've got, a, I've got a Wagner's material on Romans in, uh, on my computer. And I said, I'll give it to the computer. I'll, I'll, give it to, <laughs> I'll give it to the committee, but it has to go in as it is written. No editorial work. <laughs> and uh, and, the, and that's, that's what it did. So if you see the book uh, Wagner on Romans, that's where it, where it came from. And then the Everlasting Covenant, 1900. That's one of the first books, I think, that I read by Wagner. And Glad Tidings in 1900. And these are all excellent materials on salvation. And Wagner's book on Christ and His Righteousness, we are given a glimpse of what was said in Minneapolis. The chapters of the book were from the series of articles two months after the meetings in 1888. And these are the first writings of Wagner on the subject written in the early part of 1889, just weeks after the 1880 conference. Um, the foundation of righteousness by faith. His message presented Christ as the savior of mankind. And when properly understood through a heart appreciation of, that, of Christ and the message he's given to us of what it costs the Godhead to redeem us, this truth results in a heart surrender to God's will, producing faithful obedience to all the commandments of God. That's the purpose of this message. To have us to fall in love with Christ, with the Father, with the Godhead, angels, and the law of God. The foundation of righteousness by faith is here. He was accused of being, uh, well, uh, I don't know if he was accused of universalism. Uh, that's the teaching that everyone is going to be saved eventually, no matter what, even the devil will be saved eventually, according to universalism. He never taught that. In fact, he read, I think, that, uh, so he had about 10 articles on universalism in the English present truth. And he really demol demolished the arguments against that. But he did talk about universal salvation. That does not mean that everyone is going to be saved. But everyone has been saved at the cross of Christ. You remember, there are two places in Scripture. One is in 1 John 4, 16, I believe it is, that God sent his son into the world to be the savior of the world. And then when he was talking, uh, recorded in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and when she discovered that she, he knew things about her that he, she didn't want him to know, she ran. She left her bucket <laughs> with the water. But she was on, tire, on fire for God, and she shared what had happened to her at the well. And they, so they wanted Jesus to come. He came and stayed in that place for two days. And at, at the end of it, they said, Now we know and believe, not because you told us, but we have heard him with our own, our own ears that he is the savior of the world. That was the teaching he could not say with his own, uh, uh, share with his own people because they had a fence around them. So and they said it was impossible. And so, but the, here was a pagan Jewish group that were open to the gospel and they responded fully to it. Tremendous. And then later on, uh, others, uh, after Christ was crucified, disciples went up there and had many converts. It's tremendous. But Christ was, he planted the seed, uh, seeds there. But here, this is what uh, Wagner was asked. Do you mean to teach universal salvation? And this is what his response says. We mean to teach just what the Word of God teaches. Uh, we teach that the grace of God has, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Titus 2.11. Or bringing salvation to all men. God has wrought out salvation for every man and has given it to him. But the majority spurn it, throw it away. The judgment will reveal the fact that full and complete salvation was given to every man and that the lost have deliberately thrown away their birthright possession. Thus, every mouth will be stopped. I believe these concepts could be shared with Antifa, BLM, and uh, Marxists and Communists there will be some that will respond. I'm, I'm sure of it. Some of them are trying to work out their own salvation by destroying other nations. It's not going to work. They're doomed in their doing. But if they could see Christ, accept Him, their change would be complete uh, in rejoicing in Him. Again, this is, God has sent men to bring us the truth that we should not have had 
unless God had sent somebody to bring it to us. Fantastic. So we come now to the Communist Manifesto of 1888. Now again, I mentioned before that this one was, uh, it, it was unedited as far as I can tell. They took the 1848 booklet and this is Engels that uh, reprinted it. And it got more mileage, I think, than the other one. But you'll notice here there are, you see they got weapons, cannons, and things like this. This is how they were going to change the world. <laughs> they were going to overthrow capitalism primarily and any nation that stood in the road. And those guns are aimed at the United States of America. Maybe, not, well, yeah, there are some, even handguns <laughs> that some are using. But um, here's a picture of Marx. And this is the, this is the original uh, Communist Manifesto that he and Engels wrote at that time. And before, this, before he wrote this, he wrote many poems and play, he was a playwright. All of them were demon-possessed. This man was a demon-possessed man. I've got a couple of the couple of poems here that, uh, that uh, we'll read, read together. Now, the theory of the communists may be summed up in a single sentence. Abolition of private property. If they can, if they can accomplish this, they've got us. There are religious people, and I would say I'm going to mention the Pope. He's one of them. He's not the only one. But he has said that all, he says, well, people can have uh, private property, but they need to remember it belongs to everyone. That's why you see destruction, that from, from, this is from uh, Marx, Marx's idea, uh, in uh, uh, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, destroying other people's property because these people either can't have it and they don't want anybody else to have it either. But according to the philosophical underpinnings of the papacy, if you need something, whether it's money or land or food or whatever, if you don't have it, you go to someone that does have it and you can take it because it's yours. And that's going on in the world too. And these two are going to coalesce. They're going to come together. Both, both are operating the same principle. And I think in the 1890s, Pope Leo the, um, the 13th, he wrote a, an encyclical and he attacked both communism and democracy. And it was very strong. And then the popes after that opposed it. And it wasn't until this pope that he began to soften up and admit that uh, communists had something to offer. It's amazing to see some of this stuff come together. It's going to come together. And we know who's going to be on top. Uh, you ever read the book uh, Keys of the Blood by Malachi, Malachi Martin? A Jesuit priest. He wrote this from a Catholic standpoint. And he said there are three entities in the world that are vying for, uh, for authority, capitalists, the papacy, and communist Russia. And he said capitalists are not interested in ruling the world. <laughs> they're only interested in making money. So they're, not, they're out of the picture as far as ruling the, r ruling the world. That leaves two, the communists and the papacy. They're the ones that really have the practice. They know how to get it done. And then he made this statement the papacy will come out on top. <laughs> They've been around longer. They know what to do. And he's absolutely right. If you read that book, I don't know if it's out, whether you can get it anymore or not, but, uh, but he, he said some tremendous things in it about this very thing. Now, in one word, you reproach us, again, Marxism, with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so, that is just what we intend. Page 23 of the copy that I have. The middle class will vanish as a matter of course when the, its complement vanishes and both will vanish with the vanishing of, cap, the, of the capital. This is, what they're, this is what they're after. And I mentioned earlier, this is a reprint of the 1848 uh, edition. And it's a call to arms, physical arms. And it summarizes Marx as the history of all hitherto existing society 
is the history of class struggles. He was, what he tried to do was uh, get classes to, f to fight. Your, your capitalist was a class, and your working class was the other class. And he was trying to get the, the uh, working class to rebel against uh, capitalists. He started in Germany. He was run out of Germany because of his uh, reactionary principles that he was trying to put into effect. He tried it in Belgium. He was they, they chased him out of there. He went to France, and he loved the French Revolution. Of course, this was about, I think, 18, 1840s, I think it was. And there had been a, another revolution in France, and that failed, but he was all for it. And he was, wor he was for, commended the worst of the revolutions, revolutionists in, uh, in the French Revolution. And then he was run out of France. <laughs> the only one that was open to him was England. And then his buddy uh, Engels, he met Engels in France, and they became close. Now, Engels was a son of a capitalist. He had plenty of money, and his father sent him to England to take charge of his textile industry there. He had uh, ma he manufactured both in, I think, three places, one in Germany, possibly Prussia, and then England. And so his son was sent to England to be in control of that. And this guy was rolling money. He was a capitalist, and he sided with Marx. He's the one that gave Marx the money to keep going. Marx was a lazy, no-good man. He wouldn't even support his family. Two of his kids may have died from starvation because he wouldn't work. He had, I think, seven kids, six by his wife, one by the housemaid. And two of his daughters, well, one of them committed suicide. Uh, a man that she lived with for several years, he up and married another woman without her knowledge. And she just gave up and, and killed herself. The other sister and her husband, who was a Cuban, who Marx hated. He was a racist. <laughs> he hated this, his son-in-law. Uh, but the son-in-law was a strong communist. And so he and his wife, which was Marx's daughter, one of his daughters, they had a suicide pact. I think that's what happened. Some say that, no, she killed herself. But I think it was, it was well, she may have, but it was the suicide pact between the two of them. And... Uh, Coming back to Marx, his father supported him for some time, and they finally cut him off. And um, Marx had been a Christian at one time. Actually, he was a Jewish man. His father, his grandfather, was a Jewish rabbi. His father converted to Christianity and became a Lutheran. And uh, Karl Marx was raised as a Lutheran. He went to college, and it was in college he became an atheist. One of his teachers, his religion teacher, was an atheist. <laughs> and so he became an atheist. And he got into the philosophy of some of the men at that time. And then uh, when his father cut him off financially, then he went to Engels. He knew that Engels had a lot of money. And Engels supported him and his family the entire time that they were alive. Absolutely amazing. And uh, anyhow, the, uh, this book briefly features their ideas of how the capitalist society of the time would eventually be replaced by socialism. They, they, they knew it was going to happen in their own day. It did not. As I said before, he was a failure. But in the last paragraph of the manifesto, the authors call for a forcible overthrow of all existing social conditions, which serve as a call for communist re revolutions around the world. In 2013, the Communist Manifesto was registered to the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural organization called UNESCO. You may be familiar with that. The memory of the word, the word program, along with Marx Capital, this is another book they wrote against capitalism. I think it was in 1867. This volume one, and it is the political tract in which Marx presents the core of his philosophy and revolutionary program. Karl Marx used class warfare, attempting to divide people. Marxism today, however, uses identity politics and racism to divide. But the goal is the same. Marxism, Marxism divides people into either oppressors or victims. 
He calls for the overthrow of the evil system, which to him is capitalism. And then he seizes complete power in the name of fairness. The Communist Manifesto formed the basis for the modern communist movement, arguing that capitalism will be replaced by socialism and ultimately communism. I mentioned before, he was a failure in his own lifetime. Russia was the first to feel the failure of Marxism in its communist revolution. I mentioned this earlier, which started in 1917, ended with the dissolution of the USSR in 91 <clears throat> for a total of 74 years. Here are the great failures. You have Marx on the far end, and um, Engels, and then Lenin, Stalin, and Mao. And uh, someone said, oh, Mao was a, I mean, the communist China was a success. It was not, I, th I mentioned this earlier. It was a complete failure. They could not feed their own people until they switched to capitalism. Russia did the same thing. I remember reading that, I think it, was, it might have been in high school, many moons ago. I don't remember when it was. But the people were starving. In fact, uh, there's a, one of the nations in Europe, oh, I, I've been there, can't remember the name of it now. They actually starved the people out because they were independent. They didn't want, uh, didn't want to go along with Russia. And uh, Ukraine, Ukraine, that's what it was. And, um, but I read how they, they had five-year plans. This is agricultural. Uh, programs and they had this plan so that they would put the people to work. Do you think that you think people would work? <laughs> there, there would you have some people maybe a very a handful that might put in a good day's work, but you have the slacker and they they would see what's going on. Well, it, um, we're going to get the same anyhow, so <laughs> so let's let's not work. We're, we're going to get we're going to get fed. But by doing that, the people are not working. They were not getting good crops, and so who was it that supported them? The capitalist United States of America sent tens of millions of bushels of grain to them to keep the people alive. Amazing. But communism in Russia was an utter failure. Don't let people tell you that it was a success. It was not. The same with China. Um, I guess we've, I've got this here. I've mentioned this only. Uh, only. I'm going to do it again because Marx was a failure. Russia failed, Cambodia failed, Cuba failed, Venezuela failed, China failed, and the question is, will the United States fail? If we imbibe the principles of Marxism, Mar Marxism, we're going to go down the drain. And, uh, and then other things will come. But okay, socialism, c communism. I mentioned this before. C they want to control the working class and the poor. And um, the government and privileged social elects r remove the middle class. That's what they're after. Um, something happened just, uh, what, about two weeks, probably last week, no, two weeks ago. I went to get gas. And signs there, no, no gas. And I said, this is strange. I hadn't heard, you know, that there was a shortage of gas. And there was an attendant out there, and I said, why is there no gas? I said, have you been he said, we ran out uh, three or four times last week alone. I said, what's going on? He said, there's plenty of gas in the storage tanks, but they can't find drivers to drive the trucks to fill the tanks. And I said, could that be because they're getting a handout from the government? He said, buddy, you got it right. <laughs> so these guys are making more money sitting at home, or maybe a little less. I don't, I don't know what they got as truck drivers. But they, they would not work because they were on Easy Street with government handout. And that, that's across the board today. Maybe some of you may have gotten a check. <laughs> we did. We gave it away. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, this is, you know, the reason for all of this is control. People wanted to control other people. That is where we're at today in this. So these two men, we've talked about them. I'm probably going to uh, uh, skip over more, but they, they both sh shared a hatred of European industrial society. They hated it. And that's, in 1848, they wrote the, their book. I mentioned this. Uh, yeah, they spent their lives attempting to destroy capitalism and to force socialism in England, Europe, and the United States. This was their goal. And they utterly failed. Thank God for that. 
Why did they fail in England and the United States? Were, were the workers being treated wrongly? Yes, in some cases. They had child labor, that sort of thing. They should not have been doing that. But it's because of the principle of Protestantism. The Protestant worth, work ethic, put in an honest day of labor, work hard, and you, you'll reap the benefits of that. That is why they have never made any progress in Protestant nations until now. But it's because our nation as a Protestant nation is shifting to socialism. Communist, communism could not penetrate Protestant nations in Europe. The only ones that they got into were Catholic countries. Amazing. But they could not penetrate Protestantism until now, until the last maybe 50 years or so. Okay, I mentioned this. He, he, um, oh, yeah, he refused to work. He was for violent revolution. This was his passion, not his family. He said he loved them, but, and they loved him, but he was, he was, not, he was not a father. The, the girls, I think, loved him. There's no doubt about it. They all became communists, but uh, they, did, they got nothing from him except communism. Now here, besides pushing his passion of communism, Marx wrote poetry and plays. And I've read several of them. I'm, not, I'm going to show only a couple of them. And here, here's a book that deals with this. The Devil and Karl Marx by Paul Kengor. And I listened to a, um, a video presentation between himself. It was an interview by the president of the Baptist Convention. And they were tossing this idea around what was going about the book. And uh, the book is fascinating. Uh, now, later, Marx had an obsession with the devil. And he sought in every way possible to kill God and also all uh, organized religion. He hated it. He had enormous sympathy for the devil and clearly, in some sense, believed in the devil. They couldn't tell whether he believed in it or not. I don't know what they did either. But he was demon-possessed. There's no doubt about it. Marxism is demon possession in the United States. I don't care who they are. And this is the danger that we're facing. And the message that God has given to us is to confront this and convert some of these people. Some of them will, will come, not all. But that is what we're faced with today. Um, now, in, uh, oh, this is about this interview with Albert uh, Moeller, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. It wasn't the, it was the seminary, not the organization. Um, Ken Gores said that Marx's writings about the devil were first discovered by his original biographer, a guy named Franz Mehring. When he discovered these writings, he told Marx's daughter, you should not let this stuff see the light of day. If this is bad. This is really quite frightening stuff. And that was covered up for years. But now it's out in the open. Thank God for that. Um, Bering was so alarmed by Marx's poetry about the devil that he did everything he could to prevent the publication of his poems. The diabolical side of Karl Marx is pointed out by Ken Gore, long before Karl Marx was writing about the hell of communism, he was writing about hell. In his poem, The Player, Marx wrote, The heaven I forfeited, I know it full well. My soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell. That's a sad commentary. In a play that he wrote, he said, See this sword, this blood-dark sword, which stabs unerringly within my soul. Where did I get this sword? The prince of darkness. The prince of darkness sold it to me. The hellish vapors rise and fill the brain until my heart goes mad, until I go utterly insane. This is his own conversion experience with the devil. These poems and his plays, they're filled with destruction, death, suicide pacts, as Ken Gore told Moeller. 
And I mentioned this earlier too, so I won't go over it again. He had three daughters, and uh, one killed herself, and then uh, uh, he, he, he lived with another married woman. Um, I mentioned this too, I think this, I'll bring this by. Marx was quite cruel to his son-in-law, this son-in-law, because he was partly Cuban, and Marx was a vile racist. And he referred to him as the gorilla. This is why we're seeing the racism today in the United States. It is raw racism and hatred. Marx hated humanity. He hated his own family. The only reason that Marx was able to do what he did was because of the inheritance that Engels inherited from his own wealthy, capitalistic Christian father. This is an interesting point because in the 10-point plan, and I, I had the 10-point plan on there, and I thought, ah, oh, we're not going to go through all that. But in the uh, point three calls for the abolition of all right of inheritance, inheritance. But this hypocrite took it anyhow. <laughs> so this is amazing to see uh, how they acted. He refused to get a job. He refused to work. His father supported him for a while, and then Engels did so. And Engels felt sorry for, uh, for the family. I think that's why he did it. But Engels himself was corrupt. Um, but anyhow, this book that I mentioned before, it focuses on um, death, or the, the uh, coming is a long march of death, deception, and infiltration. Focuses on the diabolical side of Karl Marx. And he points out that long before Karl Marx was writing about the hell of communism, he was writing about hell. I think I, sh I should have taken that out, but I didn't. Now, in the preface, Kengar tallies the uh, Marxist death toll as approaching 100 million, some of you estimated more, in the 20th century, and asks, what sort of warped idea could unleash such agony? Now, this is through, most of this was through the Russian uh, <coughs> experiment and I would say China, and uh, Cambodia, uh, uh, all of them, Cuba and uh, Venezuela, all of them, utter destruction. The author looks to the realm of the spirit, a spiritual explanation to better understand the diabolical ideology, ideology of Marxism. And that, this is a point that we need to remember that we're, we're not altogether fighting against men, blood and flesh. We are battling high devils in high places, and they're, being, they're manipulating people on the earth, sometimes with some good things to suck people in and destroy them. He demonstrates that the communist ideology possesses a bizarre seductive quality to its ideological cultists, and then he says, in some ways, we are witnessing that seductive quality today among many millennials and others who are embracing the destructive legacy of Karl Marx through socialism and communism. We can see it clearly in the riots in Portland and Minneapolis. These were planned riots, not spontaneous responses. I remember giving a study at a camp meeting and I was showing the connection between liberty of conscience and the message of justification by faith that Luther presented. He didn't always follow that, but he presented the concept. He said, I'm, I'm talking about liberty of conscience. The essence of faith is liberty. <laughs> but he didn't follow it all the way through. But when he, um, he sh well, I, I developed I get some from that, but these concepts are what Marxism hates. And I think above all, he would hate the plan of salvation. At once, he knew about it intellectually, at least, when he was a Lutheran. When he became an atheist, he probably got harder and harder and harder. Um, but what we see today, and I was going to mention this, at a camp meeting, I was dealing with capitalism, being tied with the Reformation and the freedom of England and the United States because of Protestantism and the message of justification by faith. And there was a young millennial in her early 20s. She got up from her seat and stomped out, and she says, I, I knew you were going to do that. And so she didn't want to hear it. Plugged her ears. This is a Seventh-day Adventist girl. There are Adventists who are falling for this stuff. 
There are some leaders that are falling for this stuff. I've seen two leading men. One was a religious liberty man, and the other was a pastor of one of our largest churches. They led in IBM, or LB, Black Lives Matter March. And the religious liberty man was, was called on this, not by me, but by another man. And he said, well, I don't agree with everything they do, but I believe in some of the core beliefs. You know, that, that this is nonsense. It's nonsense. It is not biblical. We need to understand the gospel, and we need to understand what we're, what we're faced with. Um, now, more than a thousand properties were destroyed, damaged or destroyed, in, uh, this is in Minneapolis and St. Paul. 100 plus million dollars in damages, mostly to small businessmen. None of the big businesses were touched because they were peddling the money into the hands of these rioters, anarchists. Local politicians not only let rioting happen, but they encouraged it. Many of these people that were arrested by the police were let go by the authorities, absolutely amazing. And then they said, we need, to, we need to cut down on police power. So they started cutting off money to the police. And then we see what's happening in New York, Minnesota, Portland, Seattle. It's chaos out there. I remember seeing the uh, film of, uh, of the um, city mayor of Portland. He, was, he went out to support these rioters when they were attacking the federal courthouse. And he was standing there next to the fence and some of those rioters turned on him <laughs> and he got out of there. But uh, it, it just, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. These people are not, it doesn't matter what party you belong to, if you get in the road, we're gonna take you down. <laughs> so it's amazing. So this is an aerial view of St. Paul and Minneapolis, just, just this one small section. But here, entire buildings are wiped out. Several small businesses were in these buildings. <laughs> All of them wiped out. Prime locations of small businesses and homes were totally destroyed. Rioting, loot, looting, and death. Here are some of the pictures in Minneapolis. And you have, you have the power salute. Um, here, Black Lives Matter. And Antifa. I don't want to leave them out. Block after block of charred buildings and windows that were boarded up for protection during rioting. Here's a man, um, Martin Weisgerber, a Bernie Sanders organizer. By the way, Bernie is a professed communist. He loved Cuba. He said Cuba had a better health care system than we do. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. But this is what he called for. He, uh, he calls for a violent communist revolution while also appearing to live a lavish lifestyle around the world. And this was by a reporter by the name of Andy Nego, I think it is, who was nearly killed by uh, Antifa in Portland. Here's some of the BL BLM leaders. These three women are the ones that started uh, Black Lives Matter. And uh, uh, at least two of them, and maybe all three of them, went for special training in Marxism and how to overthrow society. This woman, was, she was the la latest, uh, uh, the latest president of the, that organization, but she got caught. And she blames others, not bl blames herself, but uh, her finances came under scrutiny last month by state leaders of BLM after it reported she owned four homes worth millions of dollars. She bought three homes in California for 3.1 or $2 million. She claimed her salary is a little over five, maybe $5,500, $55,000 a year. And, uh, but she's under, under fire, and it's from coming from within, which is good. But I think she needs to be prosecuted, but she's not going to be. And some of these people, some of the poor blacks who were caught in some of these messes, in other, all parts of the, of the country, they said they have never received a penny, a nickel, from that organization. Where did the money go? 
going in their own pockets of the leaders. This is, this is Marxism. Here's Bible burning in Portland. Um, I watched some of the, I, I think this one is, yes, here, this, and this, this is Black Lives Matter. That's the Bible they're burning there, besides the flag. And uh, <coughs> there you see it again. But there, you can see the sign on the, they're, they're cl- clearly Black Lives Matter uh, people. Again, here's the Bible burning. Now, Antifa, I'm going to talk about him a little bit, or about them. Uh, uh, It's a book that was written by Scott Campbell. It's uh, about Satan's communists and anarchists. They are anarchists. Um, Much of what we see in the United States in the cities, the very identical thing that took place in France during the Revolution. And Ellen White speaks to that. She says, those principles that began there will be scattered throughout the world. And I think they, they were it's because of Marx. Marx sympathized with them, and Russia sympathized with them, and it has gone throughout the world. Antifa, this is history and tactics, uh, tactics by this man. He's a, he was a reporter, in, uh, lived in, in uh, Portland, and he had to leave because it, for his life. Andy Nago, I think his name is. And uh, here is the Antifa group. They look really peaceful, don't they? Um, they are antichrist, or anarchists, yes, they're antichrists also. And they use communist tactics trying to de-stab- destabilize parts of the United States through acts of domestic terrorism, such as setting fires to government buildings even while people are inside. Big tech supports this group, according to Nego. Here's a man, you've probably seen his face many times. Jerry Nadler, he's one of the high, uh, high privileged men in government affairs in, in uh, the House of Representatives. And this is what he had to say. He says the Antifa violence in Portland is a myth. And this was recorded in the Washington Times in July 27, 2020. In answer to a question by Austin Fletcher, Nadler replied, that's a myth that's that's being spread only in Washington, D.C. This was on the 60th day of rioting in Portland. So and this, this man has written a book uh, of uh, what they want to destroy democracy. And he had um, been around them for several years, I think, from time to time. And this time they nearly killed him. They threw a milkshake on him. Now, in, in those, they, I don't know if this happened or not, but the, they would take milkshakes and uh, pour this uh, fast-setting concrete and throw it in their faces. Just terrible. Now, I don't know what they did with him. That looks like the milkshake is still dripping down, but, but that's how they did some of this stuff. But here's a picture of him they, after he got through. They damaged his brain. He had to go to the hospital, and he did, co- he did recover. But they, t- they stole his phone and his camera by the Rose City Antifa, Antifa rioters in Portland. And, uh, and he has not backed down from these people. He's had to leave, but he's writing about them. And he's opened up uh, a lot of things on the Internet now for people to join him against them. But he's seeking $900,000 damage for assault, battery, emotional distress, and racketeering by those who acted to suppress Nego's journalism through intimidation and violence uh, and for ongoing neurological and health issues, the Portland Tribune reported. Now, coming back to Black Lives Matter. It's founded by community organizers. These women, that's what they were. All three of them, I believe, are lesbian. All three are for the destruction of what they call the nuclear family. What is that? That's God-ordained marriage. Husband, father, wife, mother, child. One of them is married to a transgender. Unbelievable. But it's happening before our very eyes. And it's illegal, or going to be illegal, throughout the United States to even deal with it. We catch you with, for uh, hate speech. 
Anyhow, one of the three co-founders said in 2015 that she and another co-founder are trained Marxists. Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Colors said in a newly surfaced video from 2015 that she and her fellow organizers are trained Mar Marxists, making clear that the movement's ideological foundation, and this is from the New York Post in uh, July 20 of 20, 2020. 36 years old at that time, was the protege of Eric Mann, former agitator of the Weather Underground. These are the ones that tried to bring down the, the uh, towers in New York before the, pan, the planes hit. I think it was about 10 years or so before. And uh, some of them were out of Chicago. Um, they spent years absorbing the Marxist-Leninist <coughs> ideology that shaped her uh, world view. This is members of the original 10 Black Lives Matter chapters are demanding more accountability and transparency from the BLM Global Network in the wake of revelations about co-founder Patrice Calor's lavish spending. She announced that she would resign from her post as executive, executive director of the organization in late May amid controversy over the group's finances. She had been in the spotlight for lavish spending on real estate as revealed by the Post, including a 1.4 million LA home she encircled with a $35,000 electric fence. She got the critical race theory curricula. This is a revisionist history in the school system. It was grade schools as well as uh, colleges. Um, distributed to unsuspecting children in 14,000 school districts. It's class, it's, it's uh, racism trying to split people according to color. The leaders of the Black Lives Matter organizations fueling this summer's, that was 2020, disturbances were trained by self-described Marxist revolutionaries who have long used the plight of black Americans as justification for overwhelming, overthrowing America's constitutional order. They frankly admit that such organizing is the key to their goal of world revolution. And that's what they're after. During the 2020 Democratic primary season, I've already talked about him. He's the one that said, uh, uh, I think there's one part maybe that, yeah, this is what he said at the end of his thing. He was holding a, a bottle of beer, not a bottle of beer, a glass of beer in his hand. He'd been drinking. And on the video he says, it's time to guillotine the rich. Again, going back to the French Revolution. Um, and he had described himself as a communist, said that he was in contact with groups that planned to hold mass yellow vest protests like those that have roiled France if Mr. Sanders loses. It didn't happen, but that was his intention. He said, I'm ready to start tearing bricks up and start fighting. I'm no cap, brother. I'll straight, I'll straight up get armed. I want to learn how to shoot and to train. I'm ready for the revolution. And that's what he, I'm telling you, guillotine the rich. And that's recorded in Times. All right, I want to come back now to the, what we're dealing with from the right side. Luther taught that liberty of conscience is the most important part of faith. Let there be no compulsion, he said. I have been laboring for liberty of conscience. Liberty is the very essence of faith. Justification by faith liberates. The message of salvation is liberating not containing. And once that happens, there's creativity that takes place. People who have been locked down begin to uh, get into businesses and create jobs, create things, and they become wealthy. And that's what happened after the, French, after the uh, revolution, Re Reformation. Luther taught that liberty of conscience is the most important part of faith. We've already read that. And then Interesting, in our own writings, EGW used it four times. Signed the Times, October 25, this is 1883. Again, 1884. Again, 1888. Again, 1911. She quoted uh, the, same, the same thing, it was quoting uh, uh, Daubigny, Do uh, the History of the Reformation. She quoted uh, Luther's statements there. 
Now, so here's what it is. The Protestant teaching of justification by faith that led to these consequences. Started with justification by faith, then conscience was liberated. That led to the priesthood of all believers. Now there's some, and I've listened to some Adventists say, well, the, pri the priesthood of all believers came first. And no, it couldn't have. The conscience had to be free. You don't have slaves as, as priests. They're free. They have to be freed by justification and receive liberty of conscience. Then that led to the separation of church and state. Then this leads to religious and civil liberties, free markets and economic, economics, and then constitutional government. This is how Britain was almost set up this way. Um, this is what happened in the United States. We're based on these principles. This is what Marxism and communism and the rioters today, this is, what this is the core issue that they're fighting against. God is the one who they're after, <laughs> and God's people. But God is going to have his day. Going to be completely uh, overthrow them. Um, the uh, BLM, BLM and educators and the far left politicians that want to overthrow Western society for a bankrupt ideology. Not only the left leaning, but there are right wing politicians that think along the same lines. Or nearly, nearly so. And... Uh, so here, I think I'll close with this um, tremendous statement. If you would stand through the time of trouble, you must know Christ and appropriate the gift of his righteousness, which he imputes to the repentant sinner. That is the key for our survival in the future <laughs> and right now. Jesus Christ and him crucified. His righteousness that is a gift to us. And if, we, if we'll stand with him now, we'll stand with him through the time of trouble. And he will stand with us. You remember we started out with John 6, uh, 37? If we'll only come to him, he says, I will hold you by a hand that will never let go. Never, never. never, never. It's impossible. And it's not our hold on him. It's his hand, his hold on us. I've seen the uh, a guy one time, a, um, a farmer, a milker, and he's carrying, I think it was a uh, bucket of milk, but I don't, you know, it was a pretty good sized one. And his little boy was about, uh, I don't know, four years old, I don't remember. He had a hold of that pen handle. <laughs> and he says, me and my dad <laughs> carried this. <laughs> who did the carrying? <laughs> Jesus Christ is the one who carries not only the bucket, but he carries us. And he holds on to us with a hand that will never, ever, ever let go. Shall we pray? Gracious Father, we've looked at some pretty heavy stuff today of things that are going on in, in America and around the world. But it's going to get worse. And so we need not be afraid. You've said that your love casts out all fear. And I believe this to be true. We believe it to be true. And regardless of what comes down the pike, you will be there for us, with us, and as us. We thank you so much for that. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen.